Welcome to the Mike Knox Comedy Podcast. I am your host, Mike Knox. This episode is number six, not brought to you by Haichu Banana, a delicious, I don't even know what you would call it, but the banana flavor, which is hard to find, of the Haichu variety. I think Haichu is made in Japan, and it made its way here, and it is the most delicious thing I've ever had in my entire life. So it's kind of like a, I don't even know what you would call it, a chewy, a chewy, delicious mecca in your mouth if that makes any sense. Probably not a good explanation of high chews, but definitely go and uh, eat them if you can. Some LA haunts around Los Angeles that are no longer here anymore. I would definitely check out the uh, subway terminal buildings. There's actually four of those buildings. You miss it, but uh, downstairs is still, the tunnel's still left, the ticket place is still left. And actually what they did when they tore up the subway system uh, which was from 1925 until 1955. Now we're back, you know, LA's kind of back, but our subway system rivaled the uh, New York subway system. And then there was, they say that there was a competition with the car company and some car companies. I don't want to point any fingers, but they say Ford that uh, they wanted to put more cars on the roads. And so they ripped up the uh, subway. But um, there's some subway tours in L.A. You can actually go there. It's at uh, 417 South Hill Street in downtown Los Angeles. And you can actually go down into the sort of catacombs of the subway terminal. Uh, I think they've been converted into apartments now, which would be pretty cool to live in, actually. But they the, pretty much the subway would go, uh, I guess it would be going traveling north at first. So they basically like cemented it and, and plugged plugged a uh, building right in there so there's a high rise that that stops the tunnel and then they also plugged up the other side of the tunnel which is also an apartment complex um, which I will talk about later they um, also had a, a red car trolley system and that's a lot of reasons why you have a lot of there's different areas like in Los Feliz you've got a lot of steps and those steps were for people uh, coming and going to get to their uh, homes and apartments to the uh, red car trolley system. And you can actually see the red car trolley system at uh, the um, Peterson Auto Museum, which is another place that I will discuss later on. But it is kind of, got, it's, it's cars, but it's also the history of the automobile, the history of transportation. And it's got a pretty good uh, red car and trolley system of Los Angeles, which uh, is definitely some place to go also check out. The charity of the week is the LA Mission. It is at 303 East 5th Street in Los Angeles. I've actually been in this mission quite a few times, and they pretty much offer everything to get yourself back on your feet. Specifically, I say Jamie Kennedy because I uh, think he is a very nice person. I met him at the Ice House, and I sat down uh, across from him as he did the Cool Beans comedy podcast and talked to him afterwards. And he was just one of the nicest guys that uh, I've ever met and just you know was one time that I met him but he just seemed like a very humble guy and I've always enjoyed his podcast definitely check out his podcast uh, check him out doing uh, comedy and uh, definitely check out his book wannabe I think it's one of the uh, none of the, it's one of the best books that I've ever read on trying to break it into the industry because he talks about you know he's creating he basically was it was pre-internet when he broke in so you know he's talking about he couldn't even find an agent he had to create his own agent and that's basically making your own brand and branding yourself which you can do now with, easily with social media and he really worked and hustled to get himself out there and that's why I think he deserves all the success that uh, he has gotten also uh, this week I would definitely go and eat at Cole's French dip uh, I love Cole's it has probably been around almost 100 years maybe, but it is at uh, 118 East 6th Street in Los Angeles, and it's actually got a speakeasy in it, and Mickey Cohen, the gangster, used to hold court there. I think they have a sign in the bathroom that says Mickey Cohen urinated here, and also what's interesting is the trolley system actually ran through that building because uh, kind of at the turn of the century when you had like Henry Huntington uh, and all the bigwigs there, there was actually uh, a club and I can't remember what club it was, but it was on the rooftop of that building. So the trolley ran in there. It was also a, um, uh, during Prohibition, they there's actually a, kind of like a cabinet that opens up that's still there. That's some stairs for bootleggers uh, running the illegal hooch. So a little remnants there. There's also, 
a uh, I'll talk about later, but there supposedly actually there was, but there most of them are cemented up. There was a whole tunnel network uh, in Los Angeles for prohibition. Is intervention? I've been watching that for many years, though. Um, my favorite was there was a guy Gabe on there that was addicted to gambling. And uh, he's actually a PhD, had a PhD from UCLA, I think in physics, and he just was addict, uh, obsessive about gambling. And I've noticed that in the last, I don't know, that show's been on past 10 years probably, is that uh, they never showed gambling ever again. And I think that that is because uh, gambling is the only addiction where you can win some money. And I think that it really um, runs our economy, uh, which sidebar, I think that they should allow sports betting. I mean, let's be honest, the... Uh, the uh, Super Bowl is coming up. Everybody's going to be betting on that thing left and right. And uh, so what I've noticed with intervention is that uh, everything can be blamed on your parents. And you look at everybody who has these crazy, crazy addictions. And then you look at your par- their parents and you're like, oh, I see why Billy's hooked on the old crystal meth. It makes a lot of sense to me. Or the weak is that uh, men process other men's voices with the part of the brain that processes simple sounds, such as a car engine, machinery. I would also add probably sports. Uh, but they process female voices with the part of the brain that processes music. So the female voice to the male is just lovely. It's like a fragrance of roses and butterflies and marmalade. So... I'm going to say I kind of believe that. That's a fact that um, I could go with, I think so. In the news this week, there's a lot of jibber-jabber about uh, Neil Young being upset with Joe Rogan because he had two guys on there that are giving misinformation out about the old C-19. And uh, I think it's I, I think you could really... Either way, I've listened uh, to Joe Rogan and... He had two doctors on that were doctors. They weren't veterinarians. And so they're providing their opinion. And then you got old Neil Young, who, you know, for 50-something years has been crying about free speech. And now suddenly he wants to shut down free speech. And then, you know, I've always thought, you know, why was it Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young? Who didn't really want him in Crosby, Stills, and Nash? So I think it could work to Neil Young's advantage because I'm sure there's a lot of Gen Z people and millennials that don't even know who he is. So it worked to his advantage to stir the pot and get everybody all fired up. And then they'll be like, who's Neil Young? I'm going to go buy his records, dude. So that is what's going on in the news. There was also a uh, person that used the numbers on their fortune cookie to win the lottery I've tried this quite a few times. I want to say I've tried this three times. I lost. And I usually just forget to play the lottery. And so I wish that there would be a simple way. Like I could just on my phone have the same numbers. Just on on autopilot. And that way I would play the lottery more. And that way it would bring in more revenue for the state not to spend on schools like they were supposed to 40-something years ago. Also, in the news, there was a boy... Uh, I think he was in Idaho, his eight-year-old that uh, supposedly snuck in to the library and he put his comic book on the shelves and now it's an instant hit and he didn't need an agent or anything and now he's selling his comic book and that's great and all, um, but I just don't believe the story of sneaking into the library. Nobody's in a library anymore uh, except for crazy people. So I don't think it'd be very hard for you to walk in the library and put a comic book on the shelf. I think it's great that you made a comic book at eight. I wasn't doing anything at eight years old at all. I can't even remember. I had a, a, I wanted a green machine, but my parents wouldn't buy me one. But I think that that's good that you're right, doing comic books at the age of eight, that um, you're going to go far in life, a lot farther than me. My uh, eBay purchase, speaking of comic books, was I bought the Space 1999 comic book. That was a uh, show about space. It was futuristic. And uh, uh, Martin Landau was the uh, the leader of the uh, commando team that's in space, living in space. And I, and I always thought it was cool, and 1999 was so far off, it's going to be cool, and now here we are in 2022. And it seemed a lot cooler way back then that we'd be, you know, nowhere near in space. And that uh, I really think now I don't ever want... I know that Amazon's going to space, and I know that Tesla's... There's like a space race to get up there. I have no desire to go to space. No desire to... I just, you know, I just like to... I aspire to go to the coffee bean and get myself a coffee. That's about it. 
Uh, in the uh, Strange Neighbors category, I thought I would discuss... I'm kind of running out of Strange Neighbors, but I, I know that I've had quite a few of them. It's just I've kind of put it out of my mind. But the guy that lived across the street, I can't remember his name, but it was we'll just call him Jimmy's dad. And Jimmy's dad was obsessed with his grass. My dad didn't care about our grass, but Jimmy's dad, like every day after work, was like on his hands and knees inspecting the blades of grass in his grass and it didn't even look like he really took care of the lawn all that much. But um, then we had, like, that family and another family that, like, because there was no internet, so people would communicate by picking up the phone and calling each other. But they, they had, like, a group together where we were going to go on vacation together as family. So, like, one year we went to Big Bear, and Jimmy's parents didn't go because Jimmy's dad was looking at his grass. And so we went with the Clark family, and we went to Big Bear, and it was like in December, and it was a lot of fun. It was just, you know, so cold, and my dad put a fishing pole up at the lake, and then there was like a, a we had a little, like, telescope that we could see the fishing pole, and it never moved, and I, my, you know, I would check the fishing pole every couple hours, and we never caught anything because it was the dead of winter. Uh, but, you know, I, I was introduced to Smokey the Bear signs, and... I've always had, I have a Smokey the Bear sign, only you can prevent forest fires, in the studio with me. I've always, uh, I've had a kinship to Smokey the Bear. He's prevented quite a lot of mischief. And uh, so then Mr. Clark decided we're going to, we're going to do this trip to Yosemite. And he gave us all, uh, he gave every everybody like these uh, Indian names. I know you're not supposed to do that anymore, but this was in the 70s, so he was able to get away with it. And then he made these, like, posts, um, and, like, what, you know, then he had, like, a little poem on it or whatever, and then he, so he stuck one of those sticks in our yard, and then he stuck the stick in Jimmy's dad's yard. Well, Jimmy's dad became furious because it went into the grass, and still to this day, I have no, I mean, that's gotta be the mark of a psychopath. So, then Jimmy's dad looks across the street and sees our stick in the ground and just assumes that he's a homicide detective and that he's figured out the greatest crime in the world. So he runs over with his stick and jams it into the ground and then screams, you know, he just thought, he was like, Michael, screamed out my name because he thought the, you know, the 12-year-old kid must have done that. You know, the 12-year-old kid must have put together this great, awesome stick post and then shoved that in my ground because he's attacking my grass. And so that then disbanded our family vacations with the neighbors on the block because of the grass incident, as I like to call it. So that's another one of my... My other childhood memory is... Uh, we wouldn't sail with those families, but there's other families from our church that we would sail with. And uh, so we would always go to Catalina. And then, you know, my, you know it would be like 19... 79 and you'd be out like beyond Catalina which is this island San San Nicolas Island which I think is now a military place where they drop you know some uh EIDs on people uh I know they train there but at the time it was just a barren nothing there so you're hours and hours and hours on a boat you know you're going seven knots maybe at the most and you get there and it's like yay there's some dirt so then my dad uh, got it in his head. He's got to go to all the islands that are nearby. So there's actually the Santa Barbara Islands that are off Santa Barbara. And uh, I think there's three or four of them. Well, one of them, there was a cave there. And so we're, of course, anchored there. And there's nobody on the island. There's like a shack, I think, with some fishermen. And I kind of haven't figured out why they weren't on the mainland, why they were on... I mean, I know that there's probably good fishing out there because there's a lot of sharks. And I had a big fear of sharks. And so there was a cave there, and we took the dinghy through the cave, and and then of course the dinghy, which uh, you know isn't is uh, rubber, and it went across and hit some barnacles, and so it popped. And so I'm deathly afraid of sharks. We're in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know. There's no help for anybody, and so we're yelling for. Uh, and I'm I'm in the boat with with uh, another dad and his son, his two sons, and. Uh, and I'm thinking the ship's going down. We're going to have to fend for ourselves. Uh, you know, Jaws is going to get me. And then we're screaming uh, for help. And then my dad just happened to be on the, on the, uh, he happened to be topside. And so he then comes over in his dinghy to, to get us. But he doesn't realize that our boat is halfway sinking because there's compartments in the dinghy. And so half of the boat is floating. The other part and the engine is in the, um, 
water, go to jump into his boat, and he pushes me back down into the sinking boat, and is like, oh no, stay with them. So then he tows four people in a sinking dinghy with his perfectly good dinghy and all that space, and then we get back to the boat, and everybody jumps on a bigger boat, and then the other adult starts to explain, you know, that, oh yeah, we, we hit some barnacles and we were sinking and thanks for rescuing us. And my dad's like, oh, I didn't notice that your boat was halfway in the water. And I'm thinking to myself, how did you not notice that? Like, that's such a guy thing right there is that you don't notice that there's four people in half a boat in the middle of the ocean. And so that's another reason that I always hated sailing and I don't really like the ocean all that much, but, uh, I do like comedy and I started doing comedy in Santa Barbara in Isla Vista on Del Playa. And actually there was a band there and that band was called No More. And I still can't figure out if that's the greatest name in the world or the worst name in the world. But it was K-N-O-W More. Like you're going to know more or you're not going to know more. And so the lead singer of that place, uh, that band, the guy was like, hey, do some stand up on, do some comedy. So it was like 12 o'clock at night. There's a huge crowd. Uh, they just done an ordinance where you couldn't have any music past a certain hour or something, or it might've been before that. I think now they shut off the music at 10, but it was midnight. You had like a hundred people there. I got up on the, the, you know, your makeshift stage or whatever. And I did a little bit about, uh, Eddie Murphy, uh, and his imitation of Bill Cosby. And for some reason that was the only bit that I knew. And, uh, Everybody was drunk, and so you killed it. And so that gives you the high of wanting to do comedy again. And, and a lot of times when people do start doing comedy for the first time, they get up on stage and they do kill it. So they think that they, they're they going to get back up there. So then the, the next week or so, the band guy was like, yeah, I want you to open for us. and you know, But you need material because I didn't have any, any material. So I worked on some material, and it was basically about like breaking up with, with uh, girls. And I did like a, a five-minute bit. Uh, at this uh, party that was on Del Playa and totally bombed. Uh, at least I thought that I totally bombed. And I was like, I never want to do this ever again. But what I didn't realize, because I never took any lessons, uh, I had nobody else to, nobody else I knew was doing comedy. There was no comedy up there at the time. Nobody, no open mic or anything like that. It was just all bands. And music and comedy do not mix. So you should never be a comedian opening for, because people came there for the music or people came there to the party Whatever it is, they didn't come there for the music. So at comedy clubs, people know they're coming there for the comedy. And that's the key, and I didn't know that. So I didn't do comedy for probably like a decade afterwards. But then I started to, you know, write more stuff. I took a class, and I was like, oh, okay. And I realized if you can write five minutes, you're going to do great. If you can do 10 minutes, if you can do 15, if you can do 20. And so the more that you can write, the, the big thing is just getting up on stage uh, cause that was a huge fear for me. I had a huge anxiety and get very sick when I stood up on stage in front of people. So the, the next time that I did it after that, um, I think I did comedy one more time in Del Pla in Isla Vista one more time. And it was like at a fraternity party. Um, and I think I did okay, but really my nerves, my fear got the better of me and I didn't want to do it for a very long time. So then I did it at the coffee gallery in on North Lake in Pasadena and I did 5 minutes there and then I started doing open mic at this place that was the Joke Gym in Monrovia. I don't know if it's still there it was in the back of a restaurant and then took a class at uh or at the time I was taking a class at the Ice House. And so that's where I think it is. Go take wherever you want to play at if you want to go to uh the Ice House, you want to go to the Comedy Store, you want to go to the Hollywood Improv, if you're in L.A. Um, and I should probably talk about those places later on. Uh, they uh, all have classes, and so that's where you would start, because you do. You need classes, you need guidance, you need to know. And a lot of times, just like I did, my persona was, I'm going to stand up there and be a cool guy talking about my cool stuff. And I realized that's not the way to go. You have to talk about your kind of deepest, darkest emotion. So like I get up there and talk about I'm um, being adopted and finding my mom and my mom didn't, my biological mom didn't want to meet me. So those are the things that ring true because they are true and it's your vulner vulnerability. And that's why the, after lots of training, I realized that is that, uh, that's what people respond to when they are in the audience. And so 
if you do want to do comedy, I say uh, invest some money into those classes. And then, uh, you know, that's the kind of, I'd say 50% of it is stepping up on stage and being able to get through that time in front of people. Because for me, that was the hardest of all is being in front of, uh, being on stage in front of people. And then the rest of it, if you can do that and you can continue to write material, you're going to be just fine. My, uh, other idea that I want to talk about was, uh, appliances. And I, uh, I think I named my appliances sometimes. So I have like a Tavala oven and I named the Tavala oven Tina. And if you don't know what Tavala oven is, it's just a, like a steam oven and you get the meals and then you put the, you scan the a card and then it'll cook the meal for you. Well, Tina was acting a little funny. I think she might've, I don't know what it was, but I would put the scan under the card underneath it and then she wouldn't respond. And then, you know, I'd be sitting there scanning, 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 scanning 30 times, whatever. And so I got very frustrated. So I ordered another oven and I placed that oven across the room so that Tina could see the other oven, AKA the competition. And believe it or not, Tina like changed her tune and right away, slipping that card in there and doot, 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 Tina does not seem to have a problem anymore. The problem I have now is that I have another uh, Tina oven that's just waiting to step in there and take the place of that oven. But uh, that is another oven that I, uh, I, I would endorse if I had an endorsement because I think it's uh, a very, very cool oven. I would definitely check out the uh, defunct missile silos. If you didn't know, there used to be um, probably in every major city there were uh, nuclear missile silos that were the military had, and uh, and they just abandoned them because everything's now computerized. But there's um, uh, three that I've been to, and uh, one of them is LA ninety six, and that is one seven five zero zero Mulholland. It's a very easy you park. It's a very easy little walk right there. And uh, you can go there and see the silo. The other one that I have been to quite a few times is uh, LA88 in Chatsworth. And that's at 15998 Browns Canyon in Encino. And it's kind of a trek up to the top. Uh, but once you get up there, there's like the barracks. There's the area where they had dogs because this is an Air Force base. Uh, then there's the two silos that you can, they, I don't know if they, they were open when I went there one time, the computer had been taken out, but it was still like, still had electric to it. So the actual operation, like whole computer that ran the missiles was t still there. And the, then the, and the fan was still humming and I just didn't, I didn't even have a, yeah, I, didn't, I don't even think I didn't have a camera on my phone at that time, so I, I didn't. I never took any pictures of it, but uh, it was unlocked. You could walk down the the steps into the silo, and and it wasn't very, uh, you know, it just like rain, so a lot of rain got in there. But you could see uh, there was like two two bunks down in there. Uh, definitely a lot of rats had been down in there, but uh, there were there were old typewriters and there were old. Uh, I mean, I guess they weren't that old. They were from the '60s, but. Uh, or maybe they're from the eighties. I don't know, but, uh, chairs, stuff like that. So it was just literally like, it was like, Hey, we're abandoning this missile silo. Oh, okay, great. And everybody left and there was a bus there that looked like it had probably they filming a movie there, but it looked like it was all shot up and there was a bunch of glass everywhere. But, um, that's all basically like a park. You, you can go, there's hiking trails and, um, you know, it's kind of more and more deteriorating now, but it is a very interesting uh, look at the Cold War, and I highly recommend going to that one. That, again, is um, Missile Silo LA-88. Those celebrities without a grave, and the first up is Frank Zappa. I'll be talking about Frank Zappa, uh, the musician, of course, and he was born Frank Vincent Zappa, December 21st, 1940. He uh, had more than 30 years uh, composing rock, pop, jazz, jazz fusion, all around everything that has to do with rock and roll. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and he uh, passed away in Los Angeles. He is buried at Pierce Brothers Westwood, but he is he has an unmarked grave. I've actually filmed that grave before. It's just a little odd when there's no marker to it. I wish somebody would have a marker for it. But uh, he, uh, his uh, 
He was the oldest of four and was raised in an Italian family, mostly speaking Italian. His uh, father worked at the Edgewood Arsenal Chemical Warfare Facility, proving ground for the U.S. Army uh, due to the proximity of the ar- armory, uh, which stored mustard gas, and gas, gas masks were held uh, in his uh, home in case of an accident, um, which I'm sure at that time was probably normal. Everybody was thinking about uh, Armageddon happening. So I'm sure there were a lot of uh, places with a gas mask. I know bunkers. I know there was a kid that had a bunker in my high school, which was pretty cool. It was just actually just kind of like a dirt pit six feet under with a ladder. He uh, he was living uh, living his entire life with the effects, actually, of uh, germ warfare and the ailments from germ warfare. Uh, and that's actually most likely what caused his cancer at the end of his life. His uh, father had brought home uh, mercury-filled lab equipment and brought it home for him to play with as a kid. Uh, And he uh, would play with the liquid mercury on the floor using a hammer to uh, spray out the mercury mercury droplets in circular patterns, eventually covering the entire floor of his bedroom with mercury, which that is nuts. But... When I was a kid, if I could play with mercury, I probably would have done the same thing. Uh, he developed prostate cancer as an adult. was diagnosed with terminal prostate in 1990 at the age of 49 and uh, passed away in 1993. But he had, before that, a very um, long life in... He worked... What I really like about Frank Zappa is he worked extremely hard on his artistic side. Uh, because of that exposure to the mercury, he suffered uh, asthma, earaches, and sinus uh, problems. A doctor treated him um, also with a pellet of radium, which I guess was normal, putting that in your nostrils. And, uh, hey, shocker, nobody knew that you weren't supposed to treat you with radium at the time. He... Uh, had nasal imagery and it appears in his uh, music and his lyrics because of all his problems with that mercury. Um, In 1952, his family relocated for health reasons to Monterey, California, and his father got a job um, uh, in the local area. Zappa joined his first band at Mission Bay High School in San Diego as uh, a drummer. By 1956, the family had moved to Lancaster, California, again, another aerospace area, um, more than it was a farming town, but also it's the Mojave Desert is where Ed Force Air, Air Force Base is. So again, there's a lot of military activity going on there, uh, where his father had worked and brought home the Mercury. He graduated from Antelope Valley High, and I worked in Lancaster, um, so I know that area quite well. In 1959, he attended Chafee College, but he left after one semester um, and maintained uh, disdain for education. I've actually seen him on many talk shows where he's kind of, uh, you know, anti-establishment, but basically really uh, an advocate for th- for uh, free thinking, I would say. He uh, left home in 1959, moved into a small apartment in Echo Park. I remember, uh, I think the Eagles also lived in Echo Park. So Echo Park must have been like a, a, a nice place where everybody was jamming all the time. Uh, that is, of course, where he um, was attempting to uh, earn a living as a musician going out and playing uh, night gigs. Um, later, the Mothers, uh, which was his band, were rejected by uh, Columbia Records for having no commercial potential. I do think that he had so much talent, and, you know, it's the early ages of rock, so you really are coming out of this confinement kind of, I don't know, maybe there was some sort of uh, religious views going on. But he... Uh, I think he was before his time. In 1964, after his marriage started to break up, he moved into the PAL studio and began uh, working 12 hours a day recording and experimenting with overdubbing and audio tape manipulation. That is the true form of an artist right there, somebody working 12 hours a day of their craft. Most people don't even want to work 12 minutes on their craft. In a... March of 1965, Zappa was approached by the Vice Squad undercover, uh, accepted an offer of $100 for uh, pornography or making of pornography. He was arrested by the Vice Squad and charged with conspiracy to commit pornography, a charge that nobody would care about now at all. But in 1965, that was serious beef back then. 
This uh, felony charge was reduced, and he was sentenced to six months in jail on a misdemeanor charge, uh, but uh, was given a 10-day suspended sentence. His uh, brief imprisonment left him with a permanent mark, which it should. Uh, I would not trust the legal system after spending time for a conspiracy. Zappa lost several of his recordings uh, because his studio, which was Z Studio at the time, was raided by the police and everything was basically ransacked. Uh, and taken by the man. That was about uh, up to 80 hours of recording that was seized and, and lost. Um, and of course, because of that arrest, he could no longer afford uh, that studio and um, actually tried to find that studio, but it was torn down in 1966. And I just thought, no wonder this guy hated the police so much. Uh, of course, his band, The Mothers of Invention, um, was on and cracking in the 60s. And... Um, he uh, was able to uh, sign the. Uh, he was his band was signed to uh, a, a division of MGM, and uh, the Mothers of uh, Invention, as uh, Mother was short for motherfucker. I did not know that, but it all makes sense now. Uh, one of his big one of his big catchphrases was "Freak Out." He had a debut album called "Freak Out." During the recordings of "Freak Out," Zappa moved into his house in Laurel Canyon. Now Laurel Canyon. Uh, you know, it's where Jim Morrison lived, but that was a mecca, and basically Laurel Canyon, if you don't know, just connects right down to Sunset Strip, Hollywood, but Laurel Canyon is kind of like this, you know, it was like a forest at the time, now it's all overbuilt and stuff like that, but uh, it was a place where you could literally, uh, get you could still get lost driving around there pretty much, but it was just like a little country oasis area of the hills of Hollywood. In uh, 67 and 68, Zappa made two appearances with the Monkees. And uh, so he was doing TV appearances and uh, had his band. He's on TV. He's getting notarized. Um, the Mothers of Invention uh, were in Los Angeles in 68. So, of course, this is the, you know, all the hippies are out there in the 60s. It's getting close to 69. Um, he is... Um, Got his home on Woodrow Wilson Drive, so that's way up in the Hollywood Hills, and um, that is the uh, the whole Laurel Canyon home is where he had his. I think there's some pictures of him with like he's on a giant swing connected to a tree, but I know he had a very intricate or eccentric home in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, I think that it is still there. I'm not quite too sure, but on uh, December 4th 1971 Zappa suffered uh, a series of setbacks while performing at uh, Casino del Montre in Switzerland uh his equipment was destroyed when a flare set off and uh one of the audience members started a fire that burned the casino that's you got to carry some pretty heavy insurance for that. Uh, that's actually immortalized in Deep Purple's song, Smoke on the Water, which is a great song. I had no idea that was actually uh, pertaining to Zappa. But uh, uh, after losing $50,000 worth of equipment, which is about $300,000 uh, of today, which is a lot of money for any uh, musician. Um, also, what happened to him was one of the audience members became jealous because of his girl's infatuation with Zappa. And, you know, I got to say, don't bring your girlfriend to a rock concert when you're in the front row because she's always going to fall in love with the lead singer. That's my advice. But uh, Zappa was pushed off the stage by this angry boyfriend uh, and into a concrete floor uh, where, of course, he uh, suffered some serious uh, fractures to his head, uh, back, leg, neck, my neck and my back. And his crushed uh, larynx, of course, he needs that to sing. So he basically got screwed off by a jealous boyfriend, which uh, I think we have all been there before, my friend. In 77, he appeared on the uh, Pasadena radio show K-Rock, which K-Rock was, of course, very popular in Pasadena. I really think that K-Rock led, led, um, led the charge for musicians that were not getting uh, heard by other mainstream radio stations, I would say. Because you could actually... Uh, where was K Rock? Kind of was off like Lake Street, but you could actually like people would go up and bang on the door, and then you know a DJ would like answer the door, and and they you know they'd slip him like a cassette tape, and K Rock would play it. Remember K Rock was very well known for playing your uh, tapes. Um, Zappa, of course, uh, 
was also known for fighting censorship. He remarked one time, uh, what do you make of a society that is so primitive that it clings to the belief that certain words in its language are so powerful that they could corrupt you the moment you hear them? I would say uh, that holds true in 2022. He uh, continued to make wonderful music throughout the 80s and 90s. He, of course, uh, then... um, I don't know. I think he was attached to kind of the Valley Girl thing that went on in the 80s. He um, was merchandising himself through uh, mail order merchandise. His business was the uh, Barfco Swill. In 1993, December 4th, 17 days shy uh, of his 53rd birthday at his home with his wife and kids. Of course, I think everybody knows his uh, family. He was big on... uh, uh, I would say he was on the forefront for homeschooling his kids, but I think all of his kids turned out pretty awesome. I think he was an awesome father, um, gave them some great names. He is at uh, Westwood, uh, Pierce Brothers Westwood. We're all out of time, and I come to the end, and I wish you the best of luck. Please like, subscribe, tell me who else you would like me to see, and I appreciate everybody listening to Famous Graves. <laughs>